good Wi-Fi. So if I cut out at any moment, uh, that is the reason why. As always, we uh, encourage you to um, volunteer to present a case, especially if you haven't volunteered before. And in today's edition, um, I will try to tango with the one and only mathematician, though his dance moves are a little too extreme at times, <laughs> where he's talking about RA vasculitis and other stuff <laughs> that, that very that I don't know anything about. But in any case, um, Robbie John, please take the mic from my hand, as I am not making sense anymore. <laughs> you know, they say you can blame your parents for everything until the, you're the age of 50, and here you are. Then <laughs> the so we know Reza is less than 50 years old, and it looks like, oh my God, it looks like Valeria has, a, Valeria has a case, which is super, super exciting, which will prompt me to keep my reflection um, and brief. Um, you know, I had the, the, the pleasure of really just sharing the lukewarm seat uh, with Charmin yesterday, um, and we talked through a fantastic case. But before I reflect briefly on that, I wanted to let you know that right now in the United States, folks, MS4s are matching, um, are potentially matching at their programs. And I, um, I think all uh, tremendous occasions like this are a recipe for the most joy uh, in the world. And we're hearing Dhruv just matched. Well, I, I will ask you to unmute yourself and share that news in a moment, Dhruv. Um, but I will tell you that also these days are a setup for disappointment. Um, and a disappointment because you did not match at all or a disappointment that you didn't match where you wanted to go. And um, I, I, will, I guarantee you that everyone on the CP Solvers team has many stories of disappointment. And um, we, if you are a member of the VMR community, if you even know our name, we probably know you. And please, please, please feel free to use that as a resource to both celebrate um, the joyous occasion and also to reflect on how challenging it may be. So this is a personal call out to anyone who's listening to this, you know how to find us email us and we're happy to reflect and guide you and celebrate with you and also reflect on um, some of the challenges that, that you may not have foreseen. So a lot of love from us and a lot of support, um, both in celebrating with you and helping you make through the next steps if, this, if, you're, if the ideal scenario did not happen for you. Dhruv, please, please, please unmute yourself and celebrate the good news with us, please. So, um, hi everyone, uh, it's Dhruv again. Um, it's been a nerve wracking week. I figured out that I had matched in medpeds, didn't necessarily know where. And now I just got the news about a couple of minutes ago that I matched at Western Michigan University, um, which a bit unexpected, but um, I'm happy to at least know where I'm going for the next four years. And I think your reflections are apt that Sometimes we have a preconceived notion about where we plan on going. We talk to people and we, uh, we think that, oh, this is the place where I'll be the most happy. This is the place where I will feel like I'm uh, going to have the most opportunity. But sometimes the places where you think you might be going in, in the moment may not necessarily be the right places for you. And... there's a lot of emotions to process as soon as this whole thing ends. And um, God. we're happy I'm, for you, Drew. I'm, I'm sorry. I could not have my video on to show you what's uh, the area where I found out where I matched. I have my, um, my uh, parents have come into town and they've brought my dog and oh. I just I could I would just wish I could show you everyone, but yeah, again, camera's not working, and <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I, have, I will tell you that um, I have no doubts that, given your prominent presence on VMR, that we will continue to hear from you, even when, even amongst the craziness of intern year. And I will tell you that everyone here has to be struck by the authenticity with which you approach life and the authenticity with which you're sharing this uh, uh, decision with us and this process with us. It's a privilege, and. Um, and I'm, I, I'm not the least bit surprised that five minutes after matching, you're here to dance again in VMR. And we're excited uh, for you to add your wisdom in the chat. Um, in fact, I think enough time has passed. I know Prof Rez has to bounce a little early that I actually will um, skip on the reflection from yesterday's case. You should totally listen to it. It was another Charmaine and Gabrielle masterclass, quite honestly. Um, and we'll actually ask Valeria to unmute herself, reintroduce herself and jump right into the case. 
Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Valeria from Lima, Peru. So uh, this case is actually perfect because um, I'm sure Drew will like it. Um, it's an 18 year old male, so or old man. So um, uh, do you want me to give you the chief complaint first and the HPI? Yeah, that'd be wonderful. I'm most curious before you tell us, how are you today? How's life treating you? Um, I'm great. Um, I'm really excited for everyone that it's been going uh, through the match. I've seen a lot of comments on Twitter, and I'm sure that uh, whenever, wherever you end up practicing your uh, years of residency, you will make a difference. And I'm really excited for you. Um, it's been really contagious, the happiness that's been going around on Twitter. So, yeah. Um, so that's your complaint. Yeah, jump on in. And uh, my dear friend Reza will tackle the first case. Dollar. Yes. Um, yeah, I have. I have. Uh, uh, I have presented a couple of times before, and it always has been TB. So I hope that you're not biased by that. Um, so the chief complaint is chest pain and hemoptysis. Um, the HPI awesome. is a Valeria. Maybe we can stop right there because I think there's so much just in those two words that we can uh, start our discussion. And I just want to also um, congratulate everyone and just specifically Drew, they're so lucky to have you and you're going to make a huge difference there. Um, so thank you for sharing that, that emotional, um, emotional few sentences with us. So Robbie, I'm going to tackle chest pain because I'm feeling bold today and I think my math, math skills are on par. I'm going to leave hemoptysis for you, and I would love to see how you incorporate the chest pain into hemoptysis. And, um, and I, I really love your approach to hemoptysis, like picturing the alveoli in the vessel. So with chest pain, we think about the life-threatening causes, 4 plus 2 plus 2, which equals 8. You heard of it, folks, 8. Uh, four, cardiac cause, or four cardiac causes, including ACS, aortic dissection, tamponade, and Takasubos or stress induced cardiomyopathy, two pulmonary causes, including PE, pneumothorax, and we'll add in severe pneumonia for Uncle Bob, and two esophageal causes, including impaction and perforation. You see, the time course that Valeria shares with us will be crucial uh, in determining how much weight to put on these life threatening causes of chest pain. Although some of them can present subacutely, like aortic dissection. Uh, once you get through these four plus two plus two life threatening causes, then you can take an anatomical approach. Think super superficial and then go into the viscera. Superficial could be skin, bones, and muscles. So, zoster, bone fracture, infection, um, and even muscle strain. When you go deeper in, imagine an arrow going from the, the superficial layer of the skin and working its way inward. You can think of uh, gastrointestinal causes like GERD, peptic ulcer disease, esophageal spasm, cardiac causes like heart failure, aortic stenosis, pulmonary causes like pneumonia or diaphragmatic uh, hernia, or even mediastinal pathology like mediastinal fat necrosis. So that's an approach to chest pain. The tempo is going to be crucial. The background is going to be relevant. And um, now I'm going to hand the mic to Robbie to talk about hemoptysis and see where the overlap occurs. Oh my God, your math is adding up like never before. Oh, it's going to be a doozy of a case today. I can tell already. Prof Ress is on fire. Um, and I will say that I, I will remind us all that hemoptysis is a conclusion. And how do we conclude that the patient has hemoptysis? They tell us that something that looks like blood has come from their mouth. And you really, really have to be careful because something that looks like blood coming from the mouth may not be hemoptysis. It may be something red that has come from the lungs that isn't blood, or it may be blood that hasn't come from the lungs and is coming from somewhere else that can project blood through the mouth. So the term pseudohemoptysis <laughs> implies tasty, tasty strawberry jam, like Sonia just reminded us. But also there's some you know, esoteric infections that actually turn the sputum reddish, like um, serratia and Klebsiella. Um, 
But more practically speaking, um, you really, really have to make sure the blood isn't coming from the GI tract and coming from the upper airway because that fundamentally changes your approach. Um, but here, I think in the conversation of the patient based on the nature and the color and pictures and how it was coughed or vomited up, you can make a decent progress, but it's always question hemoptysis until you know the diagnosis. And I will tell you, there have been many cases that started with hemoptysis that ended with ruptured esophageal varices. So you have to be careful. And the presumption here is that, you know, we'll have a conversation. We'll be more and more confident that the question hemoptysis becomes hemoptysis. And then the next question is, is there an exclamation mark after that hemoptysis? So you watch the trajectory. It begins with hemoptysis question mark. Could it be esophageal varices, for example? And then the next question is, is it hemoptysis full stop or is it hemoptysis with seven exclamation marks after it? And what do I mean by that? Hemoptysis with a full stop usually implies mild hemoptysis. Hemoptysis that can be wiped off with a piece of tissue. Hemoptysis with seven exclamation marks after it implies massive hemoptysis which changes the differential diagnosis radically. Why? Hemoptysis with a full stop, tissue hemoptysis, mild hemoptysis, is mild bronchitis in 70% of cases. It is diagnostic noise. But if you put three exclamation marks after hemoptysis, you're probably dealing with a sinister cause of hemoptysis. And bronchitis, the benign cause, becomes virtually implausible. So that's the journey. Question hemoptysis to are we ending with a full stop or three exclamation marks? And the, and the truth is you don't just study the hemoptysis alone to determine if it's severe or not. You study the accompanying syndrome. Accompanying chest pain is gonna push you towards the more severe kind of hemoptysis and moves you away from the most common benign cause, bronchitis. That's the lay of the land from the base rate and from the clinician meeting the patient in moment one. But if you have time to close your eyes and study what hemoptysis fundamentally means, it means that there is an abnormal connection between a vessel and an airway. That's what it means. It means that blood, which should have been going back to the left side of the heart, is now making it up into the lungs. And the question is why? Why is there a connection? Is it a connection because there's something wrong with the airway that is eroded into a vessel? Examples of those include bronchitis, which we can eliminate in severe hemoptysis, but also include bronchiectasis, includes cavitary lesions and endobronchial tumors. Those are the most common things in the lung itself that erode into a vessel. But the problem may be in the vessel itself. Now, what problems originate in the vessels and make their way into the lungs? On the arterial side, as we go from pulmonary artery to pulmonary capillary to pulmonary vein, the most common cause is a pulmonary embolism. Okay, that's a vascular problem that makes its way into the airway. There are other things too, a pulmonary artery aneurysm, and our ER colleagues will know what a tracheoanominate fistula is. A tracheoanominate fistula is when you have a fistulization between the arterial side and your tracheostomal site, which is one of the most morbid causes of hemoptysis. On the capillary side, it's either diffuse alveolar hemorrhage or an AVM, arterial vascular malformation. And then on the venous side, it's a humble reminder that heart failure can cause elevated venous pressure so high that the veins, veins pop. And just like an esophageal varix, you have the similar mechanism of hemoptysis from venous hypertension. Oy. Question hemoptysis translates into hemoptysis full stop or triple exclamation mark. Fundamentally, the question is why is there a connection between the airway and the alveolus? Is it because of a problem in the alveolus or is it a problem in the vessel? And um, for that, we'll need much, much more information, but that's a good place to start. All right, Valeria, back to you. Great discussion and with only the chief complaint. That's really um, great. So to um, talk about the HPI, the patient was uh, 18 years old he presented with a history of seven months of night fevers and a productive cough with some red spots. Uh, he referred feeling tired with physical activity, a sensation that progressively got worse. And by the time he presented uh, to, the, uh, to the ER, he couldn't walk more than two blocks without getting tired. Six months before presentation, his cough was more frequent and he expectorated uh, bright red blood every other day. Uh, reason why he went to a community health clinic where they gave him, gave him amoxicillin and acetaminophen, uh, which I know is not the right <laughs> approach, but um, that was what happened. And his symptoms persisted, but the patient uh, through the whole history and examination um, referred that he didn't give gave too much importance to his health. And the only reason that uh, he got like um, health uh, or he went to a, any health facility was because of his parents who were worried. 
So uh, his, his symptoms persisted and five days before presentation, he was swimming on a river when he started coughing, bright red blood uh, and a greater volume than usual. And hours later developed a 39 degree Celsius uh, fever and diaphoresis. His fever persisted and three days before presentation, he referred chest pain that got worse with inspiration. Uh, it was progress progressively worsened and that's why he was brought to the ER. He also referred um, losing five kilos the last seven months and his parents referred that he was sleeping 30, 13 hours every day, which was unusual for him. And that's uh, the HPA. Oh, very difficult seven months this um, young man is having. I, um, I think, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll um, tackle the fever and the inflammatory dimension and then ask Reza to reflect on everything else that localizes that inflammation. And, you know, I think um, we make that determination very quickly, is the patient inflamed or not? And as a reminder, we talked about this a lot, there are many roads that lead us to the conclusion that a patient is inflamed, but the most specific one is, is a fever. And just like anything else, you have to know the time course of the syndrome before you to be able to make progress. But say you don't know it. If you make contact with fever on day one of a patient's uh, experience, you have one job to do, and that job is infection. If you meet the patient on day one, it is infection until proven otherwise. But there are three H's that you have to track on day one. And those three H's are very rare, but I want, I want you to remember them. And that's hyperthermia. Hyperthermia can be drug induced, can be um, uh, um, and can be exposure related. So you, in in San Francisco, there's occasional super high temperatures and patients get heat, heat stroke. So the one H is hyperthermia. The other H is hyperthyroidism, and the third H is heme. The heme is uh, a reminder to think about blood transfusion reactions and acute fever in that context, and also microangiopathic hemolytic anemia on day one. So on day one, it's either an infection or the three H's: hyperthermia, hyperthyroidism and heme, but this is seven months. It's seven months of fever. Now, does the spotlight move away from the three H's? Yes, the patient's not gonna be hyperthermic, hyperthyroid, or have a maha for seven months. Is infection probable? Absolutely. But the nature of the infection is now different. The infection, if it's going to exist for seven months and not kill the patient, to put it bluntly, is hiding somewhere. And the key question is, is it hiding microscopically in the form of a macrophage and a granuloma, or is it hiding macroscopically in the form of an abscess? And that's the key question. Of course, autoimmune diseases, malignancies, drug-induced causes, and hematological things are still at play, but the focus is still on infection, but the nature of the infection is different. It's hiding somewhere in a macrophage or on some radiograph that we'll hopefully see. So where are we at? We learned that acute fever is infectious until proven otherwise, and the three H's are key on day one. On month seven, it's still on infection. Malignancy and autoimmune diseases will be prominent only after you've looked for the hiding infection in a macrophage, like granuloma, or on a radiograph, like an abscess. But here we have a lot of data to study and clues to help us prioritize where this process is, and for that, I'll pass the mic to Reza. Hi, here, Nar. Um, so... Valeria, can I ask you a question? Where where are you located? Where in, in this beautiful world? Uh, so yes, I'm from Lima, Peru. Uh, it's a city, oh. very populated. And the patient was from Lima as well. Thank you so much, Valeria. I, I am at the edge of my seat. And honestly, like in a case like this, the first branch point is going to be the lung exam or the chest x-ray or the CT scan of the chest. Because I've learned from um, Kara that when it comes to hypoxemia, the first question is, do the lungs sing to you or not? Meaning when you put your stethoscope on this patient's lung, are you gonna auscultate some abnormality or not? Because let's just go back to Robbie's beautiful diagram of, is the issue at the alveoli or is the issue at the vessel? How are we going to make that determination? Well, we're going to get a picture of the lungs. And if there's nothing that's seen on the picture of the lungs, then we're dealing with a vascular problem. But instinctively at this junction, I will be very surprised if nothing 
is actually happening in the lungs. And something else that's striking about this case is that the patient hasn't reported shortness of breath. This tells you the incredible reserve of young people. I just want you all to imagine back when you were 18 years old, think if you were coughing up blood, like how concerned would you be about such a pathology? So going along with what Robbie said, if we are dealing with an infection that's causing hemoptysis, you can think of bronchiectasis, you can think of some form of cavitary lung lesion uh, that, or pneumonia, a chronic form of pneumonia that's leading to this. But the, the duration, as Robbie said, prioritizes atypical infections like mycobacteria, tuberculosis, and non-tuberculosis mycobacteria, nocardia, actinomyces, fungi, specifically histoplasmosis, which is ubiquitous, paracoccidiomycosis, and even parasites. I think it was not too long ago that Kushal presented a case of Strongies that uh, had a rapid um, respiratory decline and diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. But we have to also be open to autoimmune diseases and cancers in such a young patient. What types of cancers? It's not a solid cancer. Solid cancers don't usually present with inflammation. It would have to be a liquid cancer, something like a lymphoma. What kind of autoimmune diseases? Well, the ones that have a tropism to involve the lung and cause diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. These include ANCA-associated vasculitides like GPA, MPA, EGPA, but also um, good pastors, the, the course is a little too long for anti-GBM or good pastor syndrome. And you can think about um, other processes like IgA vasculitis, which again, we learned from Kushal can involve the lung and the kidney, lupus, cryo, bichettes are other examples. Those are if we're dealing with autoimmune. Of the infections that lead to hemoptysis, these, I think of um, VZV, leptospirosis, but I don't like either of those given the tempo of seven months. So where am I right now? I think everything is yelling that there's something going on in the lung because of the hemoptysis. I personally think we're, we're dealing with the parenchyma of the lung as opposed to the vessel of the lung, but only a, a good physical exam and um, imaging would be able to be definitive. And then I'm, I wanna know what has this patient been doing? What is the patient's immune status? What are the risk factors? For example, is this patient exposed to you know, um, caves, to water, uh, to you know, sexual activity that may increase the risk of HIV? The immune status is gonna be crucial in this case. So. Um, Valeria, let me give the mic back to you, but just to summarize where we are, young patient, probably no past medical history, presenting with inflammation, localizing to either the lung parenchyma or the vessel. The next step is to make that distinction and evaluate the patient's immune status. Present. So in past medical history, he actually uh, was diagnosed with TB uh, two years before presentation and completed treatment for six months. Um, when he, when, well, he's quite young, so um, some of his neonatal history was relevant. Uh, when he was three months old, he suffered from respiratory distress and was hospitalized for six months. And he has, he has asthma in treatment with uh, salbutamol uh, he suffers also from recurrent headaches two, three times per week. Um, and family history, um, he's an orphan. Uh, so he lives with his, with his uncle and both of his, of, her, of his siblings have some history as well. Um, her sister suffers from epilepsy and his brother 
who is 16 years old, her sister is 14. Um, his brother suffers from heart problems, but he doesn't uh, know exactly what heart, pro heart problems. Um, in social history, they, will, they live both in Lima, uh, in a quite populated like town uh, called San Martin. Uh, he denies any sexual history or sexual contact or any risk of water. I mean, he sometimes goes with his family to 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 a uh, near river in Lima, but nothing beyond that. And no, well, he has asthma, but no other reported uh, allergies like uh, conditions. All right, Valeria, I'll just make two quick comments and then we'll get the physical exam for Robbie to um, discuss. But I think what's important here is um, we need to know, did this patient actually complete the treatment for tuberculosis? Was the mycobacterium tested for resistance to our typical anti-mycobacterial treatment, including ripe therapy? And the only other thing I'll comment on here is that this lung disease, anytime you have disease of an organ, whether it's the heart valve, like mitral valve pro prolapse, whether it's the spine, like degenerative joint disease, you are at risk of infection. Infections love damaged areas. So what the lungs tell me is, is this patient at risk of infection, not only from TB, but from other uh, infectious sources that tend to first um, start in the lung, specifically fungi. So that's all I wanted to say here. I think um, being that young, I'm, I'm not thinking of mimickers of asthma at three months of age. Um, I'm thinking that there's probably some kind of structural pathology of the lung as opposed to a mimicker like an autoimmune disease. Mike, back to you, Valeria. Okay, so uh, I'll give you a physical exam. So his uh, pressure was 120 over 80. Cardiac uh, frequency was uh, 73 beats per minute. Respiratory rate was 10 breaths per minute. And his temperature was uh, 39 degrees Celsius. Uh, so on the skin exam, we've, well, he referred uh, pruritus in both of his lower extremities. And also uh, we noted on the physical, well, skin exam, two nodules on his inguinal region that were not painful or erythematous. The pulmonary exam, which was what we were looking for, was actually not that um, remarkable to say so. Um, it was only like uh, mild bronchial breath sounds on the middle right a low and some crackles. Um, he well, he referred dyspnea as well in in rest. And uh, the abdominal exam, there was mild abdominal pain on palpation, but no ascites or hepatic splenomegaly or any other particular signs. I don't know if you have any questions um, or or, or no. Um, uh, no, I think this is not surprising at all. I think that um, when something can cause a fever for this long and a problem for this long, it's not surprising that it's hard to detect it on the surface because that's what you try to do when you do an exam. You can use your eyes, your nose, your hands, but all you're really doing is what part of this disease process rises to the surface that I can touch it, feel it, hear it, smell it. and it's not surprising when something has been lasting for seven months that the only signature that we usually see on the surface is the devastating systemic effects in the form of cachexia. So I'm not too surprised at all. I think that this is why we need laboratory tests and imaging in these cases. You no know one can make a diagnosis with an exam like this because what do lab tests and imaging do? They look inside the body. They look in the blood. They look in the lungs and the abdomen. And so I think the truth is that um, you really, really, really needed to look on the inside. And, and maybe if you're trying to stretch your diagnostic skills, you're wondering, well, what can I do with the data that I have? And the data that I have really reinforces how long this has been going on for, given how, um, given how febrile the patient is and given how minimal has risen to the surface. 
What do you do with what you have though? I think the pertinent negatives are very prominent. This is a syndrome that has been so chronic yet there is no jaundice, there is no ascites. Um, and um, the cutaneous manifestations of it are intriguing because nodules in the inguinal region um, would, would, would not be immediately connected to a problem in the thorax. So you immediately are postulating that this process, whatever it is, is disseminated in some way, shape or form. And is it originating in the inguinal region and going to the lungs? Is it originating in the lungs and going to the inguinal region? Or is it somewhere else that goes to both? And I can't tell you. The inguinal region prioritizes a close examination of that, the lower extremities for the source of the inguinal process. And importantly, the perineum. The inguinal is a confusing area. Stuff can drain from the legs to the inguinal area and stuff can drain from the retroperitoneum and the um, anal area. So. The key question is, is there a sexually transmitted process going on? Is the process in the lower extremities, the paritis driving the inguinal dimension? Um, or is there something in the abdomen, specifically the retroperitoneum um, that's draining into the inguinal region? So a lot more questions than answers, but take this. If something is hiding for seven months, you're probably not gonna make tremendous progress by studying the surface with your hands, your nose, your ears, and you probably need to take a look. So I hope we get a, I hope we get a decent look, and I know we will because of who is presenting. Yeah, so, okay, the laboratory testing was definitely a turning point. So I don't have the exact values of the labs, but the there was a leukocytosis. I remember about uh, 11,000. Uh, there was a marked eosinophilia. Um, and we actually did a chest x-ray, of course, thinking that he had tuberculosis, maybe it was tuberculosis. And the chest x-ray X -ray showed iliar lymphadenopathy. And we saw a cavernous-like structure on the apical right lobe. Uh, but it was also um, striking that there was a medium-sized nodule-like radiopacity on the medium right lobule. Uh, TB spotting studies were negative for any acid fast ba bacilli, and he had a PPD that was positive for because it was 10 millimeters of in duration. Um, and I can give you the CT. Uh, well, I don't have it, but I can tell you that it showed a hydroaerial level inside the uh, right medium lobule and uh, nodule like structure. Sorry, Valeria, it showed what you said inside the right nodular structure? I, I don't know if I'm translating, okay, but it was, oh, sorry, my God. Um, it was like a level between air and liquid. Oh, I see. Very good. All right, thank you so much. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll tackle the easy abnormality, the eosinophilia, and leave the imaging for Robbie. <laughs> um, this is definitely the pivot point. And sometimes when you get a laboratory data, you can go back and visit the exam and see, were there any clues to suggest that we might be dealing with an eosinophilic process? And the pruritus, although it in general is nonspecific, you can imagine that there's some kind of um, mast cell uh, basophil uh, degranulation leading to histamine release, leading to itch meaning that pruritus is an inside job. And we had to figure out what is the inside culprit of this patient's clinical syndrome. When it comes to eosinophilia, break it down into two buckets. And you can almost do this with any um, CBC abnormality. Is it a primary disorder, eosinophilic leukemia, or hyper eosinophilic syndrome, or is it a secondary disorder? The secondary disorders include allergic disorders like atopy, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, acute interstitial nephritis, drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome. You can think about autoimmune processes like EGPA, infections. This is very helpful. Not, bac not common bacteria or viruses, but parasites and fungi. Tuberculosis can cause a mild eosinophilia, but this degree of eosinophilia makes me 
um, less suspicious of TB. When I say this degree, it's just based on what Valeria said, that it was market eosinophilia. Um, oh, did you want to tell us what the, what the level was, uh, Valeria? How, what was the absolute eosinophil count, if you have it? Yes, it was 10%, so... 10%, uh, got it. Yeah, so this is moderate, you know, to severe eosinophilia, just like Valeria said. Um, so we talked about allergies, infections, um, malignancies, specifically lymphoma, and solid cancers of the GI tract, the pulmonary system, the skin can result in eosinophilia, and finally, adrenal insufficiency. Adrenal insufficiency cannot cause an eosinophilia of 1,000. This is when we should incorporate the, the lung findings to prioritize what might be causing the eosinophilia and pulmonary pathology. And since Robbie is going to be speaking about the lung findings, maybe I'll give him that task of trying to overlap the eosinophilia and pulmonary pathology. You know, it's amazing how you can take a complicated topic like that and reflect on it with such clarity and brevity. Because I think eosinophilia is one of the most confusing things in the world. And <laughs> the clarity with which you speak with it is just incredible. I don't think I'll be able to match that with the imaging because I'm not really sure what this is. What do we know? We know there's hyalinfadenopathy, which immediately makes me wonder, is it unilateral or bilateral? So I'll pause um, for Valeria to help us if she knows, is it on one side or is it on both sides? Ah, bilateral lymphadenopathy. Bilateral, bilateral. Okay, that's very helpful because uh, you know I was wondering because um, you, we could take the high lymphadenopathy and put it to a side if it was unilateral because we would make the assumption as a result that the air fluid whatever structure is in the upper lobe explains the high lymphadenopathy, but because it's bilateral, we can't do that. I'm going to translate an air liquid level cavernous structure at the apical lobe to a cavitary lung lesion but I don't know if that's the case. And that shows you how sometimes x-ray is hard to make the diagnosis of a cavitary lung lesion. But if it is a cavitary lung lesion, which I'm really hoping it is because otherwise I'd be very, very far off, um, it, it, it translates into an inflammatory disease process that is subacute to chronic. That's what a cavitary lung lesion is. It's something is taking a long time to eat through the lung. Now, what could do that? <laughs> Whenever we mention a chronic process, it's really infection, autoimmunity, or malignancy. And the good news is autoimmune destruction in the form of cavity is very rare. And really, practically speaking, there's only one diagnosis that does that, and that is granulomatosis with polyangiitis. Hint, look at a Wednesday's virtual morning report. The focus is on infection and malignancy, and has to be on infection first because of what we talked about earlier. So we have a cavitary lung lesion, which, which again, the focus is on infection. And what can cause a cavitary lung lesion? Really, I want you to think very simply, just like Reza taught us eosinophilia so simply, I want you to remember cavitary lung lesion very simply. What bacterial infections can do it? Two kinds, only two, a lung abscess from anaerobes or a granulomatous lung infection. That's it, lung abscess or granulomatous lung infection. What are those things that are granulomatous lung infections? Things like mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, nocardia, meliodosis, long list. What bacterial causes cause lung abscess? The causes of cavitary lung lesion, a lung abscess, or granulomatous bacterial infection. What fungi do it? Every fungus under the sun, on the other side of the sun, everywhere can cause cavitary lung lesion except candida and likely PCP. There's some cases of PCP causing cavities. Every fungus under the sun except candida. What parasites can do it? Really, most parasites can do it, but the ones with a disproportionate presentation of cavitary lung diseases are paragonomyces and entamoeba histolytica, though echinococcus is another way that you can do this. So the parasitic list is long, but the spotlight is on entamoeba histolytica and paragonomyces. So let's recap. Lung cavity, which I hope this is, is malignancy or infection with a little bit of respect towards autoimmune disease, but only a little bit. What infection? Two bacteria, lung abscess or granulomatous bacterial infection. What fungus? <laughs> what not? Candida. What parasite? Paragonomyces or uh, entamoeba. What does the eosinophilia do? Eosinophilia plus lung. I'll just tell you what it equals. Coccidiomycosis, cross that out because it's not in Peru. Aspergillus, highlight that, bolden that, underlight that, spin that, stretch that. Why? Because this patient has TB. And a TB, TB cavity is a hotbed 
for forming aspergillus afterwards. Those are the two fungi. What parasites? All of them under the sun, but prioritize paragonomyces um, because of its propensity to cause eosinophilia. So I think those infections, you're going to do a wide search for infections, but those ones you really, really want to sniff out. All right, I'll pass them back back to you. Yeah, so um, I will give you the final diagnosis, but I will tell you exactly what happened because it was actually really remarkable. So um, the... Uh, the doctors were kind of uh, anchored on that it was TB and they thought that it was pleural TB. So they said that we're going to do a pleural biopsy. But um, we actually as students, well, we were talking with the patient and the patient had a severe depression and that's, that's why he was kind of uh, indifferent to all his health problems. And we were talking to him and we actually got to have a good relationship and he told us that he felt kind of a funny taste of his sputum, a salty sputum. And that's when we thought, oh no, this is Echinococcus. And um, thankfully we, 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 well, they ordered an, an antigen, an ELISA and Echinococcus it was. And uh, it, it was actually critical because if they had done the Pleural biopsy, the risk of maybe perforating the cyst or something was high. So, I mean, it was that fact that the patient uh, forgot to mention because he was depressed and not really willing to talk much that uh, had um, us miss the, the diagnosis at all. So, yeah. But Valeria, what an unbelievable um, turn of events. I barely know anything about Echinococcus, yet alone the salty taste. Is that a clue for, like, I, I know that there's some, you know, disease in the medicine associated with metallic taste, but I didn't know about the salty taste. Maybe you can teach us and then tell us what happened to the patient. And then Rafa can take it over and teach, teach the whole group. Yeah, so I, I, it's, uh, I don't know if it's patognomonic, I mean, Kusharkan maybe took uh, more in depth about that, but it is something very characteristic. And actually, you know, Kukus is something very common here in Peru. Um, and in, in Lima, there's a lot of dogs that could transmit it. And so um, definitely something to take in consideration. Actually, the most common presentation is not as a pulmonary nodule, it's more as a hepatic nodule. The patient didn't have any hepatic nodule, but um, yeah, and it can present with eosinophilia and hemoptysis. And, and yes, as Mario said in the chat, that the salty taste means that there's a cyst rupture. So it is very important to, to act fast because it can cause an uh, anaphylactic like reaction. Just so humbling, truly. And thank you so much for presenting this. I, it's, it's great news that a very treatable disease has been devastating this patient's life for seven months. And um, can you share with us how he did? Yes, I'm not sure um, exactly what happened then, but I know that the patient was discharged after treatment. I mean, the, the pandemic struck us, so I, I couldn't follow up, but, but he did fine. And he also got treatment for, for his depression. That was kind of the, the thing that kind of made all the symptoms worse. Amazing. Well, I mean, I, I think of all the things this could have been, I'm very glad it's this um, because that certainly has a high chance of recovery. Thank you so much for presenting a fantastic case as per usual, so well prepared and really helped us reflect very deeply on this case. Thank you so much for coming and, and for being such an educational case. And last but not least, we'll have our recent step one completion person. <laughs> Rafa, congrats on finishing step one and for being here right back at it to teach us more. Please take it away. Well, thank, uh, first of all, thank you, Valeria, for the case. A really, really, really great case. And thank you. And also, congratulations, Ruth. Congratulations for anyone who matched it today. I hope everyone had a great, great time in your residency. So um, let me start. We had a young patient with chest pain and hemoptysis. And first, the uh, resume reminded us to think about the, the emergency causes, which are the 4 plus 2 plus 2 
when it comes to the heart, we have to think about ACS, aortic dissection, teponar, toxitubo. When it comes to the lungs, pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, this alpha rupture and impaction. And then this, there was this approach that I really loved, uh, the anatomical approach. We have to think about the skin, for example, zoster, bone with trauma, the muscles with strain. The GI could be a source of uh, chest pain, for example, GERD, PUG, diaphragmatic hernia. Also the heart, heart failure, aortic stenosis, the lungs with the pneumonia, mediastinal with fat necrosis. And when it comes to hemoptysis, uh, rabbit totals, then we have to make sure that it's not coming from somewhere else. So we have to think about the GI tract. For example, esophageal viruses could be leading to hemoptysis uh, and upper respiratory tract disease as well. And the uh, rabbit totals that we, hemoptysis in the end ultimately is an abnormal connection between the airway, for example, bronchiac disease, bronchitis, or the vessels. Uh, could be a problem on the, on the arterial side, like pulmonary embolism, pulmonary aneurysm, but also from the venous side, like from uh, heart failure. When it comes to fever, um, Ravi taught us about the acute uh, nature, which could be due to hyperthermia, which can be seen drug induced hyperthermia or environmental causes as well, hyperthyroidism, heme, blood transfusion reaction, but also infections. And when it comes to subacute to chronic, we thought about infections as well, uh, malignancy, especially liquid like lymphoma, autoimmune like ink associated vascularis, but also other kind of uh, autoimmune diseases like lupus, beche, good pressure. And then we saw that this patient had to be in the past medical history. So we thought about oh, was this patient treated adequately? For example, was there any resistance to rapid therapy? We thought about as well post TB complications like aspergilloma. And then <laughs> Reza always reminded us think about it in Philly, like he loves it in Philly, uh, with primary and secondary causes. Primary causes uh, could be as in <laughs> leukemia, <laughs> or secondary causes like IDOP, ABPA, EGPA. Uh, and then finally, we talk a little bit about cavitary lung lesions, which is a chronic process. We thought about autoimmune causes, but it's rare, it's rare sorry, like GPA. The most common cause is our, sorry, infection like lung abscess from an area of granulomatous infections like from nocardia, TB, also fungus, any fungus on the earth except candida, entomoeba histolytic, paragonomonas, and also malignancy. And then finally, which was the diagnosis, we tried to combine cavitary lung lesion with eosinophilia, and we thought about aspergillosis, coccygeodis, echinococcus, which was the final GX. Uh, echinococcus, uh, it, it, it can manifest Fast as high disease in the liver, and the cystic can rupture and can cause anaphylaxis. And uh, how can we uh, be contaminated with is within the ingestion of eggs in food, contaminated with dog feces, and the sheep are the intermediate host. So thank you everyone. I hope everyone had a good time. I hope everyone had a good match day and hope to see everyone tomorrow. Go Rafa! Go! <laughs> <laughs> See you, everybody. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.